Okay, so death and other details. I got to say, what a phenomenal show. And I don't say that very lightly because I, I think there's just, there's so many great shows, but every single episode, there's not just one big reveal, but multiple big reveals. Yeah. And I know that you, you yourself, as one of the writers on the show, as well as your character, Teddy Go, um, were instrumental in that. So um, with that, Angela, I just want to, you know, I guess start off by saying congratulations. Um, and I'd love to you know, chat with you about death and other details and a little bit about your personal life, too. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's so sweet of you. Yeah, we worked really hard on it. And I'm so glad that everyone's enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. And um, it was definitely a nice escape that we needed after the years we had locked up during COVID. Yeah, it's just a fun, but also captivating story with a number of wealthy families on a cruise for a very specific purpose. And then mystery and murder and sabotage and family secrets get spilled and your character Teddy Go plays the maitre d' of of the boat but also you wear a number of other different hats in the show as well um would love to know from you how would you describe your character in three words if you can encapsulate it in that controlled deliberate protective yes and do you personally connect with any of those traits uh as Angela I think definitely. Um, I think obviously very protective of my friends and my family, but then also the controlled part is, I think without giving too much away, you would ask yourself, where does Angela's acting end and where does Teddy's acting begin? Oh, very interesting. Yes. Okay. So it sounds like you perhaps drew upon some of your own personal experiences in, in creating this character. I'd love to know, like with that, then, you know, what were some specific experiences that you might have drawn on from your own lived experience to, to bring to your character, Teddy? Yeah. So, you know, Teddy, in some ways, she is also like me, she is an immigrant, um, but from a very, very early age is the way I sort of saw it. And in some ways, you have to ask yourself, like the way she behaves, the way she speaks, how much of that is her actual lived experience? that maybe it comes off as her lived experience, but how much of that is her putting something on, you know, maybe watching some certain movies. As an immigrant, you watch a lot of movies and sometimes you learn how to like speak and move in a certain way by modeling yourself off of somebody like a role model you can look up to, right? Uh, for Teddy, I think, especially at the beginning, the maitre d that you see her as she's potentially very um inspired by let's say my fair lady and audrey hepburn how she's able to go from a certain part of society to another part of society entering sort of like a new in crowd just by changing the way she stands and speaks and dresses and i think teddy was very inspired by that um i think that's really interesting too because i think that um at least even like on on a personal level for me um, I, I find a lot of times, especially as actors or as people trying to make a name for themselves or career-wise, we take on the character traits or embody or mask our, our true selves sometimes um, based on a situation. And even, you know, Teddy is a character, um, you know, it's kind of called out on that or like Rufus, uh, the world's greatest detective, kind of questions her background a little bit and you know where her, where her accent is from and tries to understand her. And with yourself like being an immigrant, but also like having so much like international experience, speaking multiple languages and having gone to school abroad and such. Um, did you ever feel like earlier on in your career or even as a student that you had to mask or take on some traits to be able to, to fit into a particular situation? Honestly, I would like to think I'd be more aware of that and like actively trying to fit in somewhere. <laughs> but I think, you know, it was kind of like a very Kiwi way of going about it. I was like, I'm just gonna try and give this a shot. I'm gonna move to LA. Um, luckily, during that time that I could see there was a wave going on from my interning behind the scenes, I could see that there was a space 
for more Chinese US co-productions. And I'd heard from mentors that people were looking to cast people who were Chinese and could speak English, but could also speak maybe Cantonese or Mandarin. And so it was, it was really like, I didn't really need to hide that part of me. And luckily my mentors like advice was great too. And it worked out that, you know, there was a series regular that they were looking for on Hell on Wheels, um, specifically Chinese female who could speak Cantonese and then also be a boy for a, an episode and a half without anyone noticing. So I think that was kind of lucky on my behalf. I didn't really need to hide any of it. The, the only thing that I sort of downplayed at the beginning of my career was the fact that I also wrote. Um, and that's just because, you know, you're starting out and you're picking a lane and you're throwing all of your effort into that to try and like get noticed in the market first before then you go do more things. No, totally. And I think especially you know, to your point, as you're starting out, people are trying to understand like, where do you fit in? How could you potentially be of benefit or your skills be of benefit to them? So um, with that too, I mean, like a, a number of follow-up questions based on what you've just shared is, um, you mentioned how uh, the character that you played in the Hell on Wheels, and as well as uh, Death and Other Details, speak multiple languages, and you know, and I know you you're a, a native like Mandarin and, and Cantonese speaker as well. W what I love about this show is that there are uh, not one but two main Chinese families in the cast with yeah, very yeah. very different stories. Yeah. Um, you know, the Chun family is very wealthy; they're guests on the boat, and the Go family you know works as the crew. Um, and it's the, honestly like just so rare to see uh, the depth and dimension of these characters um, and with the language uh, as well there's the interchanging between English and, and Mandarin or English and Cantonese I, I just love seeing that and I think that in terms of representation that is not something that I've seen uh, on this kind of level of platform so I, yeah I want to hear like from you, um, what was that experience like? And when you saw the script, or when you were developing the script, pardon me, um, with your other with your fellow writers, because uh, I know there are many. Um, yeah. Like, how did that make you feel? Like, what was the conversation like in the room when it came to the interchanging of language and bringing that full cultural background to these characters? Okay, so first of all, all praise goes to you know Heidi and Mike. Because actually, when I first signed on, it was just as an actor, and I read the pilot. And in the pilot, it actually had the distinction between the Mandarin family and the Cantonese family. And I, too, like you, was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe there's this many Asian characters, for one. And it's this authentic and nuanced, and it's not about an Asian show. It's like not a show about being Asian. It just so happens that there are Asian people on this cruise ship and then they have their specificities. Um, I was actually surprised that Heidi and Mike even knew about that. And it turns out it's because Mike's college best friend and his original writing partner when they first moved out to LA mm -hmm. is Zi Chun. All praise goes that way. Um, we just helped fill stuff in in the room, but you know the whole setup was all Mike and Heidi at the beginning. Um, as as for changing of the languages, I think that's great too. It's once again, it's the showrunners and working with them, and them being so open to input and collaboration. Um, I think a lot of the times when you're doing that, it's hard for somebody of another language to tell you which words you might say in which language, and so it's nice to have the freedom to sort of like decide for yourself which ways you go. And if you thought like, oh, you know, actually you wouldn't necessarily use English there and then to bring it up and then being all fine with it. So it's all a collaborative process and it starts from the top. Really cool to hear. And it's not something where it was just, you know, a, a Asian families or an Asian character was just kind of tacked on for the diversity metrics or, or anything like that. And we're starting to see a lot more in-depth and really authentic integration of our stories that actually honor our heritage um, as vast and diverse as they may be. What do you hope to see in terms of the next step of you know, representation and like culture um, specificities and language in shows that are not just about being Asian? Well, so I guess once again, not to give anything away, but I do really enjoy there's a part that talks about Celia's 
backstory. And I think what's really cool about that is the purpose of that sequence is to reveal the backstory of a character that is potentially a murderer um, and then to understand them more. But we were able to set that in very, very specific historical contexts that perhaps your average viewer wouldn't know about, particularly of people of Chinese descent, because the way you're seeing it now, there is a lot of like the crazy rich Asian portrayals, but you don't really see like the process and the sort of economic circumstances that kind of led to all this stuff. And so I just thought that was really great to be able to set it in such an authentic context, but for it to not necessarily be about that. It's really, it's still about revealing the character in a murder mystery, right? Uh, yeah, it's just, I once again, I'm trying to do this without revealing spoilers. I know, it's so hard, right? I know, like, it's, it's, words. <laughs> especially for a murder mystery. Oh my goodness. Um, no, I, re I really love hearing that. And it sounds like it was a really wonderful and collaborative process to be able to, to bring that to life. And not just the portrayal of, but also the lived experiences of a variety of, of Asian individuals and, and families. So with that, I mean, uh, kind of going back to your, your character a little bit here, there are parts of the, of the series where Teddy is uh, kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, you see she's trying so hard to hold it all together. And it is revealed that what she does with her day job is very different than what she likes to do, let's just say, when she's off duty. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and we get to see multiple aspects of her that we wouldn't normally see Asian women uh, have the actual agency to choose for themselves. Uh, with confidence and clarity and really just owning those personal choices. So uh, can you speak to that a little bit um, and what that meant to you to be able to play a character with um, that had multiple facets to their personality? Right. So actually the diversity you see um, of Asians on screen is actually reflected by the amount of Asians we had working on the show behind the scenes as well. So in the writer's room, I wasn't even the only Asian female writer. We also had MJ, who was one of our writers too. And then we had executives as well who were new about it. So during this time when we were deciding like who, you know, what, what would happen and who would be, have what backstory, we actually debated a lot about this. And um, in the end, particularly MJ and I found we had, <laughs> this sounds horrible like this like low simmering asian female rage we were sick of people treating asian females in particularly as like the most vulnerable population and the most easily picked upon demographic you know and so we we really wanted to have a situation where it's like we have a ca characters that are strong and are powerful and are maybe worthy of being feared like, does that ever cross people's minds? And so we wanted that. Um, luckily, Teddy is not the only Asian female character. So also, she didn't have to carry the weight of representing everyone. So she could be a little bit more out there because we had plenty of other characters to do other things. Um, and ultimately, in the end, we, we felt that you're kind of caught in a rock and a hard place, even writing Asian characters, unfortunately, especially when um, there's only one of them. Luckily, there's more than one. So we were a little easier there. But you run the risk of like, if Teddy were only one way, she would come off as the model minority, right? She'd come off the, as the total sexless model minority. And then on the flip side, if she was totally the other way, she would come off as like, a dragon lady <laughs> and, and you know like potentially being not not to say that she can't die in the series you know can't give that away or anything like it's just having multiple dimensions to her means that she's not put into one stereotype or the other um and then the reverse is if you don't do anything outlandish with her character then you end up with a bland character that maybe nobody likes and then people are like oh why is it like oh we can't have a lot of asian characters on tv because nobody seems to like them nobody likes to watch them well like that's because you you're so worried about like hitting some sort of stereotypical box that you end up writing them like completely bland right? So you don't want that either. So I like, kind of just walking this tightrope. <laughs> no, I love that so much. And thank you for sharing that insight, because I, it really is that delicate balance and that burden of representation. Absolutely. Like, I always think like, oh, the more projects we have, the more 
space and room there are for you know a range of different stories but it's not just that it's about like when you have multiple characters of Asian background and that actually play Asian and not just a generic character that could be played by anybody um that's where you create those opportunities to really change those narratives and actually change perceptions of what it means to be an Asian woman in this particular example. You know, one thing we do like to ask typically when we interview creatives um, is we'd like to ask them what your pearl of wisdom is. So if you could share a pearl of wisdom, it might be like advice or a mantra um, for emerging Asian creatives, both on screen or behind the scenes, because you do both, uh, what would it be? It's to not hold yourself back. You know, just because you not don't necessarily see a pathway doesn't mean that one can't make your own way and devise your own path. Things are getting so much better and it's actually like the community is so strong. Um, and I think it goes for not just Asian creatives, but any creative at the end of the day, you're going to be hearing a lot of no's, a lot of no's from other people. You don't need to give yourself your own no's, right? You just need to be true to yourself. And you, if you know this is what you love to do and this is what you're meant to do, and every day, no matter how hard it is, that you can't imagine doing anything else, then you're on the right path you know, and you just got to stick with it. And one day, all those no's will become yeses. I love that so much. And thank you again, Angela, for your time. Congratulations on the show. And we look forward to uh, seeing what you do next and let us know how we can support you. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, it was lovely meeting you. Mm -hmm.